overview on some of the work that we've been doing over the past year and a half. This is a fairly new um, activity for us. Uh, the work was done by Adam Grice. Uh, he's a graduate student at the University of Georgia. His thesis advisor is Johannes Abate. Johannes is a world's expert in uh, two-dimensional um, uh, mapping, optically mapping two-dimensional van der Waals surfaces. Uh, Phil Stanchel is a theorist, and then uh, Michael Scheibel and myself from Georgia Tech uh, were contributing to this. Um, I want to point out the uh, title slide. There's actually useful information on this title slide beyond it being some pretty colors. It's actually a hyperspectral map of a lunar sample. But I want to point out the scale bar on the right. It's 500 nanometers. So then if you look at the delineation zones between the red and the, and the blue and the green, uh, the pixel size there is on the order of 10 nanometers. So we're doing spectroscopic mapping of surfaces at the 10 nanometer scale while obtaining real topographical information and spectral information simultaneously. So I'm gonna move this down. So this doesn't advance. There we go. So they, we were very specific about looking at samples that have been abused. When we selected these, we were by abused, I mean they've been kicked around a little bit and they've been space weathered. So the two samples I'm going to show you data on is the 15445 Brescia. It has a shock norite and a spinel troctolite class. It's um, thought to be an ejector from the Imbrian Basin. It landed in the Spur Crater. It's about 200 million years old. The other sample is an ilmenite basalt. It's rounded on all sides and it has a, a lot of micrometeorite pits. So it's been bombarded by micrometeorites. These have been on the surface for a while and they've been subjected to space weathering. So actually what we're after is optical signatures of space weathering. Okay, and we're gonna approach this in, from a different perspective. We're gonna approach it from the atomic and molecular perspective. And we're gonna uh, use nanoscale um, technology, and this was initially developed in the early 1990s. There's a patent that was filed where it shows that you can do a force microscope image looking at the force and the deflection of this cantilever, which has a nanoscale tip. You measure the deflection with a laser, but the trick here is actually you come in with another laser right at the tip and you get a field enhancement, and therefore you can then do diffraction limited measurements at the tip while moving it. And then you can monitor the, the force, get a topographical map, and then look at the scattered fraction and get an optical map. And that's formally called scanning near-field optical microscopy or ENSOM. Now, the good news is, is that this is now commercially available. Um, you can now buy these systems. They're very good. They're very expensive. It's not like they're cheap, but you're, this is a, you get what you pay for sort of a thing. Uh, you can map out the infrared vibrational frequencies with the nano FTIR. You can get phonon modes, and therefore you can back out information uh, uh, with respect to the atomic positions in the molecular structure. You can also scan it and run it in a different mode where you have a, instead of exciting it with a mid-IR laser, you can excite it with a visible light, and then you can look at the emission spectra and look at scanning photoluminescence. Now, the emission spectra is due to electronic transitions which are typically due to electron traps and defect sites, they're most often correlated with the inclusion of other uh, dopants or other ions, in particular uh, iron, magnesium, chromium, and neodymium. And you can do this in a scanning mode too. Oops. So uh, this on the, uh, on the top is the uh, frame that you saw on the, uh, in the title slide, and that's the um, hyperspectral mapping in phase space. Uh, at 935 wave numbers. And so that's the 2D image. And then you can do this at, uh, as a function of wavelength and construct a three-dimensional hyperspectral cube. And if you look at the X and Y axis on the cube, you'll see this is in microns. It's not labeled, but it's in microns. And then if you look at the heterogeneity, which is clear on the top, uh, that's frequency dependent. You can look and zoom in in that heterogeneous zone and map that out as well. So we'll look at what's going on in the submicron dimensions, but with optical resolution. So here's a near field amplitude map, and you can begin to see that there's features there in the amplitude spectrum. The topographical map is a visually more um, easy to, uh, to recognize. You can see these step edges and edge sites. If you look at the scale features, the step height is about 10 nanometers and the ledge, ledges are on the order of hundreds of nanometers. 
So you know, the other thing you should note is there's a whole bunch of different colored spots on the surface. So what that means is we can take the tip and take a spectra at that point as well and see what that looks like and see what is the degree of heterogeneity. And so here's the amplitude plot and you can see all of these spectra, which is you know, colored differentiated, they're all the same. So that means that all of these different spots give me the same spectra. On the left is the amplitude plot. On the right is the phase plot. Most spectroscopists will plot it in, in, in the phase uh, uh, way, uh, but it's in, and I, I would like to convey that it's useful to look at both the amplitude and the phase. And, and, and this is also the same. And then there's a Christensen feature here that's labeled CF. A lot of people look at that when they're looking for space weathering. I want to convince you that you want to go down a little bit and look at the, the, the feature right next to it. That, that's probably more diagnostic. In order to understand what these are made of and, and to test the apparatus, we looked at the near field FDIR spectra of a number of terrestrial samples from Micah's personal collection. They're on the top. On the bottom of this left hand frame are the uh, nano uh, FTIR spectra of the lunar samples. And you can do a, a, a construction of these and you can figure out what they're, you know, they're composed of. And it's primarily an orthite. Um, on the right is the spectral library for far field measurements. And um, you know the near field and far field measurements match pretty well except for forest right. But there's a circle here on uh, the 1212016 uh, feature that I, I wanna pay attention to. And that's right uh, in an area which is the one next to the Christensen feature. So here's a map of the you know, the ilmenite uh, basalt sample. This is the one with all these micrometeorite pits. So there's the amplitude and the phase plot for this particular sample. Again, you can see that all of the spectra are, are very, very similar. Um, if you look at the phase maps or the, the uh, AFM, it's not as clear with Three regard minutes. to the crystallinity. You can see that this is a more of a morphous sample. Um, and there is this feature that's really big at 1150 wave numbers that was not present in the other sample. So the question is, what is this? So we were looked at this carefully and uh, on the left is a compilation of all of the other minerals and, and, and we can also find out that this is, has a large anorthite component to it as well, but it does not, none of these uh, mineral samples fit this 1150 wave number band. It turns out, uh, you know, we turn to Phil and we ask him, can you model this? And in particular, can you calculate the dielectric function of a damaged material and in particular an amorphous glass? which has primarily SiO3 motifs, which is formed when you break SiO side bonds. And sure enough, he did that and it fits pretty well that amplitude feature. So it's, it's the blue signal that fits this what, you know, quite well in the amplitude and phase spectra. There's another sample we looked at, which is a sodium bearing uh, mineral and that doesn't fit it, particularly in the amplitude spectra. So um, we're, we're going to interpret this as a signature at the atomic level of a disruption of the silicon oxide silicon lattices. So we would point out that this is probably a good feature to pay attention to when you're looking for uh, damage. Now, these can be made by an impact event or ionizing irradiation. We don't know specifically which one. We do know that we can learn more about impact events if we look at the rare earth elements that are uh, present. And we did this by doing scanning photoluminescence. So here's the spectra for the 15445 um, sample. And almost all of the spectra we've looked at has this big hump sitting at 700 and it's pretty boring. Turns out this sample is not. It has the very reproducible features. There's a hump around 800 and a very big peak at 900. And so we fit this spectra and extracted it out uh, what the uh, composition of this is with respect to the ions. And you have your, your standard, um, suspects. Iron's there, manganese is there, but what is prevalent here, which is not in most any sample, is the chromium and neodymium, and these can be delivered by impact events. So I'm going to finish on time. Uh, so our conclusions are spatially resolved hyperspectral mapping, in particular nano FTIR and scanning photoluminescence, when done together, are very useful to probe lunar material compositions. The phase and amplitude maps reveal information of material damage, I broadly call this space weathering. Um, and I, I think this 1150 band, uh, wave number band is, 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 is a good signature of broken silicon oxide bands. 
And ions that are known to be in the sample from the database from, from NASA, we're able to see them easily, but it's very pretty much specific to this particular sample. And on that, I'll stop.